Hello, USU community, family, soul seekers, friends, some of you I've met, some of you I haven't. Wow. Let me just share with you that our, our guest today is somebody who I have wanted to interview and have on here for a long time. I have uh, been working through her book, The Inner Bonding Workbook. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll see it. Um, I'm really, really grateful to have Dr. Margaret Paul today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about her and we're going to dive right in. Um, and I'm just going to tell you now, this is going to be one you, you definitely don't want to miss. And for, for all of all of you out there, for my, my uh, beloved soul seekers and friends and community members, just I want to let you know this, this conversation, you know, we, we set the intention for this to really, to, to, to be a blessing and to help you get as connected to loving and honoring yourself, bonding within yourself. So, all right, Dr. Margaret Paul is a best-selling author of 12 published books, 12. She is a relationship expert and co-creator of the powerful inner bonding and healing process, which we're going to talk about. She has appeared on numerous radio and television shows, including Oprah. And Margaret is a member of the Transformational Leadership Council. Oh, I love that. So I just want to thank you, Dr. Margaret, for being here, for your gracious time, for this beautiful work you've been doing. You've impacted my life and so many. And just just thank you for, for being here. I'm so excited to, to dive into this. Great. I'm looking forward to this, Julie. So, all right, you've got 12 books, but we're, I would really love to focus because for me, you know, and I, and I will say, and I'll just show it again, this inner bonding workbook. It's no joke. <laughs> it is <laughs> no joke, like lots and lots of reflection and questions and work on, on this inner bonding process. Can we, I'd love to talk about the inner bonding process and how you developed it. You know, maybe let's just like put that on hold for a sec. Cause I actually, for those that don't know you, maybe just to tell a little bit about your story, how did you even get into this work? Um, and did, did maybe share when you didn't feel that inner bonding, um, and, and perhaps what life was like, uh, and got you, what got you into this path? Well, I, um, like so many people came from a dysfunctional family and <laughs> my mother took me to a psychiatrist when I was five. And he, um, he said to me, my mother was an angry narcissist. And he said to me, tell, tell your mother not to yell at you. And, and I remember thinking, I, I'm only five years old and she's not going to listen to me. And you tell her. And my next thought was, I could do a better job than you <laughs> at five. That's when I decided to be a psychologist. And so I, um, I practiced traditional psychotherapy for 17 years. I had tons of my own therapy, many different kinds. And after 17 years, I just wasn't happy with my own therapy and with traditional psychotherapy with my clients. And I started to pray for a process or a teacher, something that would really work fast and deep and actually heal. And that's when I met Dr. Erica Chopit. She's the co-creator of Inner Bonding. She had half the process. I had half the process. So spirit kind of brought it all together for us. That was 38 years ago. And it was just a very good thing that um, it came at that time because I had been really sick as a kid. And in my early 20s, I read a lot about food and I went on all organic and I got a lot better. But in my mid 40s, I was really ill and I had no idea why. I was married, I had three kids, I had a wonderful practice. I didn't know why I was so sick. Inner bonding showed me that it was self abandonment. It was, I was a caretaker and I was taking care of everybody else's feelings my husband, my kids, my parents, my clients. And not me. And you can only do that for so long. And of course, a lot of women and some men also are trained to be caretakers, trained to ignore ourselves, trained to abandon ourselves and take care of everybody else. Well, you can't do that forever without getting completely depleted. In fact, I see many women with cancer who are caretakers because they've gotten, their immune systems have gotten so depleted. 
So when inner bonding came in, I realized, okay, this is an amazing process for learning to love myself. And that's when I started to practice it. And that's when I got better. Oh, that's amazing. That is, I, I had shells as you were speaking and I, and I, I don't want to get too much of my story, but let's just say I, I, I've experienced this myself. That's why when I found this book, uh, my dear friend, Jesse Harless, who I know you've met and talked to as well, was like, Julie, <laughs> you've got to get this. You've got to, you've got to, you know, you don't have to, but it, I, I could see how it was helping him. Um, this, this self-abandonment, um, this, you know, and I want to say, I know men do this, but I, as a female and knowing many women, I think, and mothers, this is something that I see with, I'm sure you've seen with so many women, mm -hmm. um, and I'm just curious, um, I guess where I'd like to start is, you know, with inner bonding, I want to go through the, the process and what that looks like, you know, for someone listening. And it's funny, I just did an episode about self-care, not being selfish, like this, this notion we have that if I take care of myself somehow that, you know, we've been conditioned that it's selfish. So where do you even start if, if that's been like in doctrine, you know, if you're feeling like, I mean, I know sometimes illness can bring in that, that, that feeling of uh, desperation. Well, actually self-care, self-love is the opposite of selfishness because it's about truly taking responsibility for our own pain and our own joy and not blaming others, not making others responsible. You know, this is a problem in so many relationships where people blame each other for their unhappiness and make each other responsible. And that is selfishness when you blame somebody else and say, well, they're supposed to give themselves up because you're unhappy about something. That's selfishness. But really taking learning to truly take responsibility for our health, our well being, our peace, our joy. There's nothing selfish about that. In fact, it relieves everybody else around us of the burden of worrying about us because we're taking care of ourselves. You know, when, when I look back at my, at my parents, I would have given anything for them to take care of themselves and make themselves happy because being a very sensitive and empathic child, I was very tuned into their pain and always trying to take responsibility for them mm. and make them okay. So that was their selfishness of not taking care of themselves. Mm. Mm, powerful. Oh, that's really, really well said. And I have to say, just for those, if you're not watching Dr. Margaret, like your energy, you, I don't know your actual age, but your vitality. I mean, I'm like, you clearly are taking care of yourself. Your energy is just jumping out of, of this, of the zoom room as we're speaking. And it's, it's incredible. We got on. I'm like, I know she's been on the planet for some time because you got Okay, I'm happy to tell you my age because <laughs> I like to inspire people. I'm 83 years old. Oh my gosh, everyone, hold on, I need a moment. <laughs> I need a moment. There is no way, no flipping. I mean, I shouldn't say that. Um, I, my new inspiration is you, my version of you, because <laughs> I was thinking maybe in your 60s, maybe, maybe at this point, given what you've told me with people in your life and wow, 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 wow. So, you know, this is interesting. I, I, without getting off course, there's so much focus. That's a whole other conversation on anti-aging and, you know, all of mm. these things that I, I've always felt, you know, and I look to Louise Hay a lot for this as well, you know, just this loving yourself is the most, is the, is the, I don't even like using the words anti-aging, but it's, it's the best way to, you want to shine and you want to, <laughs> you know, have good skin. Right. And, 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 you know, you don't want to get, get old and decrepit and, and not be able to do what you want to do and lose, lose your vitality. You don't have to, if yeah. you really learn to love yourself physically and emotionally. All right. Now, now I'm, I'm beyond hooked in. I, I, I'm, I'm a little, I'm, I'm still in shock. I'm like, no way. There's no way I would have even put you in 70 or above. So, all right. So now that like, you're just living proof of this work, you literally are emanating like youthful, vibrant energy, which is just beautiful. Let's, let's dive into this process. And if you can, 
you know, without obviously, no, you know, without going through the entire book, but kind of the high points of it and, and how it works, I would love to give everybody a taste because it's been very, very healing for me. I had already been, as I told you earlier, and I'm very open. I've been doing a lot of inner work through 12 steps, through other mm -hmm. coaching. I am a coach. This though, I have to say, I, I just, as I've been working through it, I'm like, this feels so aligned for me. In, in all ways. So let's dive in. Where, where do we begin? Okay. So let's begin with step one of inner bonding. Perfect. So like I said, when I was growing up, I had learned to take care of everybody else's feelings, but I was completely out of touch with mine. And the thing is, our feelings are a source of inner guidance. So when we're out of touch with our feelings, we're not getting the information we need. Our feelings let us know when we're loving ourselves, when we're abandoning ourselves, what's happening with another person or a situation, they're, they're a powerful source of inner guidance. So step one of inner bonding is learning to move out of head focus, mind focus, and into body focus. And this in itself is a practice. It took me quite a while because I was living in my head and tuned into others, but not to me. So it's a practice of getting in your body and being willing to be present with your feelings, especially your painful feelings. When we grow up, we, we uh, as kids, we don't have the capacity to manage a lot of pain, to manage loneliness or grief or helplessness over how we're being treated or heartbreak. I mean, there's so much heartbreak for many of us and, and, and loneliness and, and deep pain. Well, there's no way that we could have managed that. So we had to learn to get out of our body and into our head. Now we have to go back because we were actually born in our body with our feelings. Now we have to go back to being present and being willing to learn to take responsibility for our feelings. That's step one. And of course, it takes some courage to be willing to feel your painful feelings, but most people have many false beliefs because they have beliefs that they developed in childhood about not being able to handle pain. Mm -hmm. As adults, we can learn to handle our pain and learn from our feelings. And it's so freeing when we're willing to do that. So step one, being in your body and taking responsibility, being willing to take responsibility. Step two is breathing into your heart. And in inner bonding, there's only two intentions possible to choose from. One is the intention to learn about loving yourself and sharing your love with others. And the other is the intention to protect against pain with various forms of controlling, self-abandoning behaviors. That's where all of us are. As we grow up, we've learned to protect. We've learned to avoid. We, we've learned to try and control getting love and avoiding pain and feeling safe. And that's what we call in inner bonding, the wounded self, the ego wounded self that is just devoted to having control over getting love, avoiding pain and feeling safe. But it doesn't work. It might've gotten us through childhood, but it doesn't work. It ruins relationships, it ruins health. It's getting in our way. So in step two, we breathe into our heart and we open to learning consciously open to learning about loving ourselves. And part of being able to heal and have a role model for what's loving to us is being able to access our higher self. Mm. And whether or not people believe in God, this doesn't matter, but we have a higher self. We, we have um, information that we can access when our frequency is high enough to do that. And it takes basically two things. One is being open to learning about love. And the other is keeping our body clean with clean, fresh, hopefully organic food. Because if you're using junk food um, and junk thoughts, <laughs> uh, you're gonna keep your frequency low. And spirit exists at a higher frequency than we operate on. So um, eating well is part of loving yourself. And that's what I learned to do in my early 20s, which I still do now over 60 years later. And it keeps my frequency high enough with the intention to learn about loving myself 
to have what I now call at will access to divine guidance. And that is a fantastic way to live. I never thought that that was possible to have that at will divine connection, but it actually is possible for everybody. So in step two, until people learn to do that, they can just imagine an older, wiser part of themselves, like a part of themselves 500 years older. And that, that higher self is filled with love and compassion and, and strength and wisdom and power and truth. And we invite that in. We just say, I invite these beautiful qualities of love and compassion, wisdom and strength into my heart. And we breathe that in. That's how we create what we call an inner bonding, the loving adult. Now, most of us have no role modeling for a loving adult, but the inner bonding process, the practice of these six steps actually develops new neural pathways in the higher brain. And this is what our mutual friend, Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor yeah. discovered that it creates, we have neuroplasticity and anything that you practice for a while creates new neural pathways. So when you practice inner bonding, you're developing the neural pathways for the loving adult, which makes it so much easier to take care of yourself. So once you're in that connected state, we go to step three. And step three is we breathe back into our feelings, back into our body. So let's say when you went in in step one, you felt numb or you felt depressed. You go back in, you breathe into that, or you felt anxious, whatever, you breathe into it and you get present with it, you sit with it. And what you want to do at this point is imagine that those feelings are your inner child. Your inner child is your soul, your true self, your essence that communicates instantly, often through feelings. And so we want to get present with those feelings. And if we're feeling anything other than peace and fullness inside, we want to ask, what am I telling you? How am I treating you? What am I doing or not doing that's causing you to feel anxious or depressed or empty or alone or guilty or shamed or angry or any of these feelings that we call the wounded feelings because mm -hmm. we cause them with our various forms of self-abandonment. So let me just briefly go through the four major ways we abandon ourselves. One is we stay in our head, like I said. Two is we judge ourselves. Most of us have learned to judge ourselves. Oh, I'm stupid. How could I have said that? I'm such a jerk. I'm not enough. Uh, I'm going to end up on the streets. Um, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll never be enough. I'll never do anything right. It's all my fault. So many judgments. A third way is that we numb out with various addictions. Many of us, many of us have learned very many addictions, whether it's substances like food, alcohol, drugs, or whether it's processes like being on the internet or being on Facebook or pornography or sex or shopping or spending. I and mean, there's so many ways that we can numb out. And a fourth way that really affects relationships is to make somebody else responsible. Hand that inner child over to somebody else. Here, you make me happy. You make me safe. You make me feel that I'm okay. It's your job to do that. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, very many people do that. It's called a codependent relationship. Mm -hmm. Very many people do that. And when you're abandoning yourself like that, you don't have love to offer anybody. And so there you are trying to get love and since we attracted our common level of self-abandonment or self-love, the other person is doing the same thing. They're trying to get you to fill them up. And it's a disaster. That's why there's so many relationships that don't work. So in step three, we're trying to discover how we're abandoning ourselves. Mm. And once we discover that, we go a little deeper because the part of us who is abandoning ourselves is a younger part that's programmed with so many false beliefs. And we call this the ego wounded self. Um, Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor, uh, Taylor calls it character two. It's in the lower part of ah, our brain. Yeah. Okay, it's in the fight or flight mechanism and it's very programmed with false beliefs. But this is a way to discover 
the false beliefs that may be governing your life. Because once you understand how you're treating yourself, let's say you're judging yourself that you're not good enough or you've got to be perfect. Um, then you go down and say, well, why? What do you believe will happen if you judge us as not being good enough and that we have to be perfect and do everything right? Well, we go down into what is the belief and very often there's a belief there that says, oh, well, first of all, there is a perfect and I better find out what it is. Secondly, um, that's the only way I can control other people. If I'm perfect, I can control them. So there's a belief about being able to control others. And then if I can control them to like me by being perfect, then I'll be okay. There's another belief that other people have to define whether or not we're okay. So just in that, there's a ton of beliefs that we need to be discovering. And once we discover some of these beliefs in step three, then we go to step four. In step four, we are dialoguing with our higher guidance. And we're asking what is the truth about any of the false beliefs. So let's say I'm saying to my guidance, well, is it true that if I'm perfect, I can control how people feel about me? Well, my guidance has said to me, no, we don't have control. Just like nobody has control over how you feel about them. Um, you don't have control over how others feel about you. And there's no such thing as perfect. And they're going to likely feel manipulated and pulled on by you. And they'll probably pull away and you'll get the opposite of what you want. I mean, there's all kinds of information we can get when we're really open to learning about the truth. And the next question we ask is, what is loving to me? And this is a question that I encourage people to start to practice, whether or not you feel you're in touch with a higher source, to start to say, what is loving to me right now? What's in my highest good right now? I ask this all day long. What's loving to me regarding my time? What's loving to me regarding what I put in my body? What's loving to me who I spend my time with? It's a great question to get in the habit of asking. And once you start to get some answers, and this is gonna take time to access your guidance. Once you get the answers, step five is taking the loving action, whatever it is you're guided to do. And there's thousands of loving actions we could take about many, many different things in life. And step six is going back into how are you feeling? And if you have actually taken a loving action for yourself, you're going to feel some relief. You're going to feel um, less guilt, less shame, less anger, less depression, less emptiness, less anxiety. You're going to start to feel some relief. And that's how you know that you've taken a loving action. Now, anybody can learn these six steps, but as you know, they take practice. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Y yes. Yes. And yes. And yes. And I, so I, I love, I love how you define this. I have some questions. I feel like, um, sometimes I hear questions that I think others are asking. And I also have my own because I've, I've been working through it. So I'm going to, um, I'm not, I don't love the term devil's advocate, but I, I have a question for you. That's been, um, can we go back to step one <laughs> for a yeah. moment? This is so brilliant, by the way. It's so brilliant. Actually, before I even say that, the thing I want to highlight that just what rings so true for me is the core of this. If, if I can bottom line it, if I think what's come through to me is it's all about this question, how to, how to teach myself to be and do loving things for myself. And that when you're in that space and that vibration and that energy, even asking that question. And that has been one of the most transformative things for me. And I have to say, Dr. Margaret, sometimes what's been challenging is what comes up, what the answer is. Um, I'll, I'll give an example. Um, the most loving thing for me was, you know, at one point in my life, not to stay uh, was a very good person, but the marriage was not the right fit. And the most loving thing with young kids was not to stay there. And that sometimes those answers, you know, it's bringing tears to my eyes. Like it was really, I was really confronted. Um, and so anyhow, I know there's a range, you know, today, like you said, you know, with food, I've struggled in the past. What I do is I look at it and I hold it. And I think, 
what is this? Is this loving for my body? Is this food right. not what my mind wants? So just to say, I know that that question, that, that has been a game changer for me, that, that question. Um, yeah. And, and I know exactly what you're talking about. Cause I had to go through the same thing because um, when inner bonding came into my life and I was so sick, I was in a long marriage. I was married for 30 years and I had three kids. And when I started to practice inner bonding, I was terrified that if I started to love myself instead of caretaking everybody else, I would find out that they didn't really love me, that they only loved how I took care of them. And so it took a lot of courage for me to start to love myself instead of take responsibility for everybody else. And everything that I was afraid of happened. My parents disowned me. Um, my 30 year marriage ended and two of my three kids were angry with me, mm. but I got my health back. I got my vitality. I got my creativity. My work started to soar. So even though it was so hard to find out that these people, my parents, my husband, my long, you know, long-term marriage didn't actually love me, wasn't going to support me in taking care of myself instead of caretaking them. That's really hard to find out, but I would do it again. As hard as it was, I would do it again because mm -hmm. I, I actually wouldn't be alive right mm -hmm. now if I hadn't have learned to love myself. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, I'm just, my heart is like, <laughs> oh, I'm holding back tears because I, I relate and I know others I'm sure listening relate. It's very powerful what you said and you wouldn't change that. That's, that's, that's really living in a heart led way. And it's, it's not always easy. I, I mean, I, I didn't have exactly that, that that's pretty extreme. And um, it's interesting because I think, you know, I've, I've read a lot about codependency and big fan of Melody Beattie's her book and, and that work. And I, and I think for so many of us that it, the societal kind of norms and what we expect, it's, it's kind of set up to honor codependency, not self-love, which yeah, it's a problem. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, especially as women, we're mm. more naturally nurturing and giving and yeah. more right brain and bringing in that, that love, um, but it gets taken advantage of. Mm. And that's the problem because then we get really depleted. Yeah. And, and, and I kept thinking, oh, if I, if I just keep giving, I'll get it back. But I didn't get it back. I just got sick. Yeah, yeah. This is the theory I have. I, I think it's more than a theory. I, I really, I've seen this with um, my own self with, I had a complete health breakdown when this was all happening and I'm still, I mean, I'm doing great, but I'm still like, you know, this thyroid condition was, was pretty intense and still working on it. So, and I know you mentioned, I mean, I, there's all kinds of just ways that this shows up manifest in our body, which um, part of the reason I'm not surprised that I, I mean, I'm super surprised you're 83 because you absolutely don't even look close to it yet as you're speaking, you know, for everyone lit, like, you want the miracle to not aging the way like you might be worried about do this work. What we talked to Margaret is talking about because you're living proof. I mean, it's just, it's, um, it's such a, it's a, it's talk about beliefs switching and, and flipping the script. I mean, this is like just completely, you know, opposite. Like you said, most of us are not taught this, um, I have a question and it's kind of been, and I hope this helps others listening. I've had a fear with going to step one and feeling your feelings. So for those in the interested in kind of law of attraction in the world of like, I'm sure you've gotten this before, you know, it's kind of like what you focus on expands. And so for me, where I sometimes straddle the line and I've, I've, I've been practicing how to sit with my feelings there was a part of me that a didn't want to feel them. Um, especially, you know, I grew up with a lot of financial insecurity and stability. Um, I mean, it makes me just tear up thinking about it and sitting with that's hard. And then there's part of me that's like, if I, if I continue to, to feel it, like, is it going to manifest? Is that going to happen more? And so, which I could hear under all of that is fear. I mean, the whole thing is fear. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I'm curious for someone like myself, who maybe there's some, there's some conflicting, I think, ideas that if you feel the feeling or talk about it too much, um, that you're going to 
create more of it or that it's, 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 it's not, you know, it's never going to go away. And so I don't know, what do you, what do you say to that? Well, see, it, inner bonding is not about um, hanging out in pain. It's not about, oh, I'm just going to feel the feeling and I'm going to talk about it and I'm going to hang out in it. No, we don't want to be in pain. It's not about being in pain. Mm. It's also not about getting rid of pain. It's about learning what the pain is telling you. That's, that's the difference between what happens with the law of attraction when you're just going down into the low frequency of pain, you get stuck there. And yes, you can manifest what you don't want. But when you're open to learning, your frequency is high. You're willing to feel the pain to learn what it's telling you. And you don't have to feel it very long. I, 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 I don't hang out in pain. I don't feel my pain very long. In fact, at this point, since I've been practicing being in my body, I'll get a flicker of it. I'll go right in. Okay, tell me what's happening. What did I tell you? What did I do? And I don't want to be in pain. And so I'm going to open to learning from it, which means I'm not going to be there very often. Brilliant. Brilliant. I have, okay. I, that makes a lot of sense. And even just coming, I have a coaching background and work with a lot of people. The focus is always that, that question, curiosity. And I'm like, oh, my little something light bulb went off. Like, oh, we're learning. And I know this, but I needed to hear it again, obviously. And maybe someone else needed that too. It's the, it's the learning from it. So you're- Yeah, it's the learning it. from it. Your, your ego wounded self is going to try and derail you because it's always been focused on trying to control, making you safe, getting love, avoiding pain. It's yeah. very afraid that if you develop a loving adult and you get guided by your higher self rather than your wounded self, that it's going to lose power. Uh, there's a big false belief about ego death, which, which doesn't happen. Yeah. But we, we do heal that part of us by healing our false beliefs. But that part of us is saying to you, if you feel your pain, you're going to manifest more pain. That is one of the lies. And the way you know it is by the fear. You see, this is, we have such an incredible internal system. Fear, anxiety, depression, guilt, shame, anger, aloneness, emptiness, jealousy, envy. They're all letting us know that we're telling ourselves lies from our wounded self. The wounded self is young. It's many different ages. We start forming it sometimes pre-birth and uh, the age of it depends on when we absorbed a particular false belief or started a particular addiction, but it knows nothing. It's ignorant and it cannot connect with a source of truth. So when it says to you, oh, if you feel your pain, you're gonna manifest that pain and it's gonna get worse and you feel fear, that's your inner guidance saying, you're lying to me. Yeah, that is brilliant. The way that I, that's so brilliant, the way you said it for me, right. I, I know if it's fear, that's not my higher self. And I usually pause and like, okay, I'm in fear. All right, <laughs> let me be with that. And what this is so, this is really helpful because you know, I mean, this is where your guidance, your emotions are guiding you, right? And I'm thinking for those that have, listen, Dr. Jill has been on here a few times. We've talked about the four characters. I love how this like links up. I think what we're talking about is connecting to character four. That character four is the higher guidance. That's right. Um, That's yes. right. Well, and, what we're talking about in, in inner bonding terms. Yes. Um, character one is up here in the upper left brain. Um, so this is the male aspect of the adult self. But mm -hmm. if this aspect this is the part that takes action in the world. And if this aspect is, uh, aspect is being governed by our lower left brain, our actions are not loving, not in our highest good or anybody else's highest good. Our lower right brain is our inner child. That's our soul. And our upper right brain is the feminine aspect of the loving adult that naturally connects with our higher guidance. When our upper left brain is being informed by our upper right brain, rather than our lower left brain, then our actions are loving to ourselves and loving to the planet, loving to others, loving to our kids, because it's being informed by our source of truth and love. So unfortunately, if you look at the planet, most people are being guided by their lower left brain, not by their higher right brain. Can you imagine 
what would happen in the in the whole world on the planet if people actually practice inner bonding develop their their higher loving adult access their guidance took action based on truth instead of the lies of the wounded self everything would change and when we do that what happens is that we feel our oneness mm -hmm. it's when we're it's when we have this connection that we feel our oneness with each other we feel our oneness with all of life we feel our oneness with the planet and we cannot do harm we cannot do harm mm -hmm. when that's how we're operating so you can imagine that things like racism and misogyny and and homophobia and all the problems on the planet with climate change, they would all get resolved yeah. if people were operating in connection with their guidance and taking action based on that. Mm. Another mic drop comment. I, I just and 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 frankly, that is one of the reasons I was wanted to have you here because it this is true. This is truth and. I, uh, I, I think about this all the time, starting with myself. And that's where we go back to the beginning. Not only is it not selfish, it's, it's, it's imperative, right? And, right. That's right. you know, it, it's like managing your energy, managing yourself, learning to operate from that higher right brain, from your higher self, from source, from, you know, and I mean, it takes, it takes energy and time. I, I've been working through inner bonding and, and other modes as well, but this, this work, it's just, it, it really, I mean, I can feel a shift. I can feel a difference. I wouldn't say it's, I don't know that there's ever perfect, but it's really, I can feel a big difference. And we know with, of course, the neuro changes that can happen with, with making those, those, those shifts over time. To me, I mean, I guess my, my question actually for you is, what, you know, you know, cause yes, you're 83. I feel like you're going to be here another hundred years. So like, <laughs> I hope so. What, how can we get the word out? How are you using inner body these days? Is it something that um, is being used in schools? I could see in communities, like I, I'm sure everyone will have the link of course, to the book and your site. Um, but to me, this is like, it, it, it should be taught in, in, in kindergarten, right? This is- Well, it, it, it should be taught. I do have a program, if I can get the funding, to put it into high schools. It's an online program called SelfQuest and it put into prisons. I'd love to be able to do that, but I, I do need to get funding mm. for that. But um, parents, if parents learn it, children learn it very easily. So if parents learn it, their children will learn it. And I have some people right now that are gonna be writing children's books about inner body and that'd be great. People can go to innerbonding.com and, and they can take our free seven day course, which will give them the, the basics of inner bonding. Uh, there's a bunch of free stuff on our site that will really help them um, with inner bonding. And one of the things that I do every other week, which I love, is I have an inner bonding membership community where every other week for an hour and a half, I'm online and um, I bring people through an inner bonding process live. Mm. I talk on a topic and then I do short laser inner bonding sessions with people so they can see it in action. And that's relatively inexpensive for people to join that. And it's a great way to really get support with inner bonding. We also have a community inner bonding village where people can join for a nominal fee. We have a facilitator training program and they can get some free sessions with our facilitators in training, which can be very helpful. We have a fabulous facilitator training program for anybody who wants to be an inner bonding facilitator. Uh, we work with people all over the world because it's online. So people all over the world can join. Um, we're gonna be starting new, new trainings in December and in March, um, different time zones so that people in different parts of the world can join. Um, so there's many ways. And of course I have many books out. There's many ways of learning inner bonding and many ways of getting support yes. with it. One of the things with the inner bonding community, um, as far as my being on every other week is we also have a buddy system where people can, can match up with somebody and support each other because that is so helpful to yeah. support each other in the process. Amazing, amazing. And I'll have all of this linked in. You know, I, I think lastly, 
I, I wanted to ask a little bit just what it's like living in this way of loving yourself and getting divine guidance, because and I want to say again, and I believe this wholeheartedly, I know you said this, that this is for everyone. Every human being has this access, right? Like you right. are clearly living, <laughs> you know, you've, you've mastered this and living in it just, it just pours out of you. Um, I, I'm curious, you know, what is that like? Do you have maybe an example of where like on the ground, just I'm sure you have many, but where that divine guidance, where that higher self connection has really, really served you or helped you? Well, it's, it's all the time. Um, I mean, I live with so much joy most of the time. And if something comes up that is not joyful, I deal with it right away with my guidance and uh, get back in joy. It, it's just, it's, it's such a different way to live, to know you're never alone. You are never alone. You are always being guided in your highest good. My guidance has saved my life numerous times, letting me know, do this, don't do that. It's always there. I mean, it, it's such an amazing way to live where you know you've got this, this higher guidance that has a broad perspective on life and can, can actually see what's going to happen before you can and give you information about being safe. To me, this is what creates safety. It's not about trying to control events or people. It's about being connected with this higher source that actually does keep me safe. And I've seen it over and over and over again. Mm. So mm. I don't want to live any other way. And I can't imagine anybody else wanting to live any other way, but it does take practice. Like anything worth learning, it takes practice. Yeah. I, I think as we wrap, what I want to just highlight and this, this is for all of us, for everyone, for, for, you know, you, whoever, if you're listening and you're feeling alone, and I, I know I've been in moments where I've felt alone, especially in the middle of the night, wake up, I'm scared about something or something's ruminating. And what you said, it's just, that's the whole point is to understand that none of us are alone ever. Right. And we right. have this higher guidance and it just takes practice to learn how to, to learn and be open, how to, to tune into it. That to me, that's the whole point, you know, that's, right. that's, that's, that's the it. point. And, and the point, I think we're on the planet to evolve our ability to love. And that's what it's all about, evolving mm. our ability to love. And so when we stay focused on that, and I do this all the time, I'm asking my guidance all the time, just help me to continue to evolve in my ability to love. There's so much joy in that. Yeah, beautiful. Ooh, well, my <laughs> my heart is like, wow, this was really, I am so thankful, so grateful. You know, I think back to that time when you were not feeling well, not doing well, where, and, and I understand that where, you know, if you've not listened, you, you probably wouldn't be here, right? And just honoring, think, thankful that you pursued to love and be loving to yourself and be in that space of authentic and what's real and true for you. And that you, 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 you've been asking these questions, how can I be more loving? I, I, I think this is really one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard. We're on the planet to evolve our ability to love. To me, there is nothing else. That's it. Right. Yeah. And so, right. That's what it's about. Yeah. Well, Dr. Margaret, thank you. You are like a radiating joyful example of this and I know for me, and I'm just going to say, I know for, for you, for my listeners, for everyone, thank you. Thank you for these gifts that you're, that you're bringing here at a really much needed time. Thank you so much, Julie.